All right. Good morning, church. Uh, so Merry Christmas, belated for most of you, and then early Happy New Year's, right? I uh, hope you guys had a great holiday. Um, this was actually the first holiday that my wife and I got to uh, spend with our brand new daughter, who's three months old. Uh, so it was great. You know, we got to... Uh, Split the, split the holiday with, uh, you know, my wife's side of the family for the first half and then my side of the family for the second half. So that was truly amazing. We have lots of pictures and videos. Um, hope that hopefully you guys also had a, uh, a great, a great, you know, holiday. Um, so if you guys will pray with me real quick before we, uh, before we get started. Uh, I'm going to also get set up a little bit here. All right. Father God, Father, we are so thankful just to uh, be here this morning and gather uh, with each other, God. We just pray that our gathering is, is pleasing to you, uh, Lord God. That as you look upon us, Father, that uh, you just see a group, God, who's just in love with you, Father God, in love with one another, God, just willing to lay our lives down for each other. And I just pray for this, uh, this message, Father, that uh, any words you want me to say, Father God, just please put it on my heart and mind to say, Father God, and take away any words that you don't desire for me to say, God, and open up our hearts, uh, God, and our minds just to hear exactly what you want us to hear. Uh, exactly what you may be speaking to us uh, this morning, Lord God. Please speak through your spirit to us uh, and through me today, Father God. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So it's a really uh, interesting Sunday because, you know, it's the 30th, um, which means uh, it's, it's right before New Year's comes. So tomorrow, obviously, is New Year's Eve, you know. Um, many of you guys will be celebrating and having a you know, great time. Um, my wife and I will be kind of, you know, playing it, you know, low key and uh, staying at home. You know, we're not going to you know, be in any big crowd or anything like that. Um, but it's a really interesting time because, you know, this is the time when everyone makes, you know, resolutions, right? New Year's resolutions. Um, so how many of you guys are like, like resolutions is like your thing. You make one most years. Like how many of you guys do that? Interest? Okay. I think two hands in the back. Okay. That's great. Now, how many of you guys are on the opposite end of the spectrum? Like you either hate resolutions or you refuse to make them or you don't prefer them. Okay. Uh, I lean more toward that one, right? Uh, I'm not really a resolution type of guy um, because I'm like, all right, if I'm going to change, I just want to make the change in general in my life. But I, I have made goals and I just didn't call them resolutions. Like, all right, this is my, this is my goal for the year, right? <laughs> I, I was like, I don't want to use the word resolution. It's just something about the word, right? Um, so the, the title of the lesson today is not just another resolution. All right, I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a second. Um, but I wanted to actually uh, just tell you guys some stuff that I, uh, I found as I researched. So, you know, just the most common resolutions. I was kind of looking into it a little bit, you know, how effective are they? And so here's, so here's what I found, right? So the top, you know, I guess most common resolutions, uh, here's the top 10. So exercise more, lose weight, get organized, uh, learn a new skill or hobby, right? Uh, live life to the fullest. That's actually pretty interesting, right? Uh, save more money or spend less money. Uh, quit smoking. Good. Uh, spend more time with family and friends. Um, travel more. Read more. So these are all pretty good things, right? Pretty normal and, 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 good, and good things, right? So how, how long do you think that these things actually last? Right? Okay, I have two days. I have two weeks, two months. Okay. All right. Week and a half. Okay, great. So, so... So I looked it up because I was curious, right? Um, and according to Forbes, um, just 8% of people who set out with a resolution actually complete or achieve their resolution, right? Just 8%, right? And then there's another app. Um, it's like an app for like athletes, like a social media app for athletes called Strava. Um, and this, uh, this, this app, uh, after analyzing 31.5 million uh, users on people online, uh, they found that most people reported uh, to failing their resolutions uh, by January 12th. That's crazy. I'm like, January, that's not even two weeks, right? It's like January 12th. That's like a couple Saturdays, right? It's like, come on, you know? Uh, January 12th, right? You know, but I had to think, you know, like what, what it's, it's such a common thing. It's a, it's a very normal and common thing to do or to make. And I have to wonder, you know, what, what makes people make resolutions. Like, why, why, why is it such a common thing? Every year, it's a fresh start. Why do they want to make a resolution? And I personally believe that people really desire true change in their lives. Like, I really believe that. It's a new start, and you think, okay, this is the last year. You think about your last year, and you think about the, few, the, the, the coming year. 
and you start thinking about what changes you want to make and what, 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 you know, what, what new things you want in your life. But I want us today to think about not just another resolution, but true change. And I want us today to look at, you know, where true change comes from. Right. And I want to break it down in two ways. Um, so actually, if you guys can turn to uh, Mark 9, we're going to be looking at Mark 9. Um, and with, the, with the, the first way, we're going to look at a couple characters in this, uh, in this story here. But what I want us to take away is that when, when Jesus renews us, then only when Jesus renews us, we can actually experience a life that we could have never lived before. Right. Only when Jesus renews us. Right. All right. So Mark nine, we're actually going to start in verse uh, 14 um, and, and we're going to break it down in two ways. This, this whole idea of renewing us through Jesus. Right. And the first way is by renewing our minds. Right. The idea that when Jesus renews our mind, that then we can truly live a new life when he renews our mind. Right. And our, our way of thinking. Uh, so here in Mark nine. Uh, starting in verse uh, 14, we'll read. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about? What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a, a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought, so they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this from childhood? He answered, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes, or for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. So I want us to, to, to zoom in and kind of focus on the father uh, in this story for this, uh, this first point. Um, and, you know, just look, take, take a look at kind of a snapshot of his mind before his encounter with Jesus. And then I want to look at his, his mind after his encounter with Jesus, right? So if you look at his experience and, and, you, and you kind of think about his experiences and, you know, in verse 17, you know, kind of talks about, you know, the, him rolling around, you know, uh, foaming at the mouth, the, 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 the spirit, you know, casting him down, you know, and then it says that, you know, he, uh, that it, it took his speech, right? And I think about that, like, as a, as a dad, like, imagine, like, if you, your son couldn't speak to you, or your child couldn't speak to you, you know, like, couldn't say, like, I love you, or you ask, oh, how was your day? You know, and you can't really, you can't even hear them tell you their day, you know, what's going on in their lives, or what you can help them with, how you can support them. And I just imagine that, like, he's experiencing this for a pretty long time. He, he had to watch his son be, be, be basically go through torment for a pretty long time. And in verse 21, it tells us, you know, it's from childhood. You know, we don't know exactly how long, but this word uh, childhood, I looked up the, the word from childhood. And uh, just a disclaimer, I, you know, I looked up a few Greek words throughout this lesson. And I'm not Greek, so I will butcher the name, but at least we can focus on the meaning, right? Um, so the word is peyodithin, right? which means like from childhood, obviously, but it also can mean from infancy. So I'm like, wow, like we just know that it could be, it's from childhood, but it could be from, from infancy, from the time when he was like a toddler, right? So we know that most of this boy's life, he's just been struggling with these things. And the father had gone through all these years. We don't know how old the boy is, but he's been going through all these years, just not seeing any change, you know? And then his faith takes another hit. He's already struggling to hold on to his faith, right? But then his faith takes another hit. <laughs> He has one last hope with Jesus and his disciples, right? Oh, this Jesus guy, he's going around, he's healing, he's preaching, he's doing all these miracles. Oh, his disciples, his disciples would be able to, they'll be able to help me out. You know, they'll, 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 be, they'll be my last hope. If no one else could do it, they can do it, right? But then they failed too, you know? And then, you know, it's interesting because I think that they failed too because of lack of faith, you know, in, in Matthew 17, don't turn there, but Matthew 17, verse 20, it's basically like a parallel um, account of this same, uh, this same uh, story here, the same uh, scripture. Um, 
And the disciples ask him, oh, why can't we drive it out? And he's like, oh, you guys had too little faith, you know? And Jesus comes down and he's telling them, oh, this, this generation, like, how long am I going to be with you guys? You know, you, you guys just oh, lacking faith. Like, how long am I going to be here? You know, I think that he was talking about the disciples, their, their lack of faith, and even the father, you know, and his lack of faith, you know. But now he's seen the disciples' inability to drive out this spirit, and that's rocked his faith once again, right? And then to pour, you know, injury on top of injury, you know, they're arguing. Instead of helping the, the son, you know, he came there to get help, and, and now the, 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 the disciples are arguing with the, the, the scribes or the teachers of the law while his son lay there probably on the ground suffering still, right? So Jesus then walks into the, the situation. And if you look in uh, verse, uh, verse 17, you know, the very first thing that he says to Jesus is like, I brought, I brought you my son, right? I brought you my son. Your, your disciples couldn't, couldn't, couldn't uh, drive him out. Couldn't help us out. And, and to me, I read this, and I'm like, this sounds kind of accusatory. Like, he's like, I, I brought you my son, but you couldn't do it, man. You guys, you guys couldn't do it, right? And then you keep on reading, and you read in verse 22, and this is kind of what this scripture is famous for, right? And he says, if. You know, if you can't do anything. And I wonder, like, why does he say if? You know? Like, there's so much doubt, so much doubt from past experiences that was just filling his mind. You know, such defeat. You know, such lack of faith there. But let's look at what happens uh, during his encounter with Jesus, right? Jesus confronts his unbelief, right, head on, right? He says, why do you say if, if I can, right? And this, you know, James 1, you know, talks about this idea of being like double-minded, you know, like, uh, you know, if we, we ask, right, when we ask, like, we shouldn't doubt, right? And the one who doubts shouldn't expect to see, receive anything from the Lord, right? And notice that at this point, when the guy says if, or the father says if, Jesus doesn't heal at this point, right? He doesn't just say, okay, I'll just heal him real quick. Since you, you doubted me and you're questioning me, I'm on the spot here, I'm just going to heal him real quick. Like, he doesn't just heal him right away. First, he confronts the unbelief, you know? And then, it's technology, you know, just, you know, and then, you know, he says, uh, okay, Everything is possible for the one who believes, right? It's possible for the one who believes. And I looked up this word belief, you know, and it's a Greek word, pistuio, right? Again, butchering, but pistuio, which means to think to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, to have confidence, to entrust, right? And the father uses the same word. He says, I do pistuio. I do believe. I do entrust. I do commit to trusting. I do have confidence, right? But help my unbelief. You know, help my, this Greek word, apista, which means unfaithfulness, faithlessness, um, disbelief, unfaithfulness, even can mean disobedience. You know? So he's like, help my unbelief. Help my weakness of faith. Help my unfaithfulness, my disobedience. Help me. Right? And he confesses his unbelief. You know, and at this point, you know, I just see the father, you know, he's, he's opening up his mind. He's confessing his unbelief. He's opening up his mind to then allow Jesus in, to allow Jesus to help him. You know, he gives Jesus the chance to change like the very structure of his thinking, the very way that his mind operates and thinks, right? And if you really think about it, this is very significant because, you know, his, his thinking, I mean, if you think about it, before his encounter with Jesus, his thinking was based off of everything he's seen up to that point. You know, the, the, the past mistakes, you know, the, the, the failures of the disciples to, to drive out the spirit, the years and years of torment, you know, and just seeing his son suffer with no relief and no change, right? But then Jesus offers him an alternative way of thinking, a new way of seeing life, right? And he, he, he taught him that if you believe, the possibilities are endless. The situation might seem limited, but I'm limitless. I can break through the limitations if you believe. And I see in this man, in his heart, right, a great vulnerability, a, a complete humility, right? He gets brutally honest about exactly what's happening inside of his mind, right? I see a broken and contrite heart, as the scripture, uh, you know, says it. So in, in Psalm 51, uh, verse 17, you know, it, it reads, uh, don't, don't turn there, but it reads, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a repentant heart. A broken and repentant heart, O oh God. 
And this is the heart that I see in this father, right? A broken and repentant heart. Repentance means like a mind change, right? Transformation of the mind, right? And Jesus sees this, right? And he doesn't just say, okay, you still have a little unbelief. I can't do the miracle. You know, you, you say you believe, but you still got a little bit of unbelief. I'm not going to do it. Sorry, man. You still got some doubt in there. Now he does the miracle, right? He does the miracle, you know? And it's so interesting to me um, because... It's so interesting. I keep losing my place in this iPad. But before, you know, the, his doubt was the leading force in his mind. So his doubt was the leading force in his thinking, right? And then after his encounter with Jesus, his faith, right? His faith and his belief became the leading force in his mind. And all he had to do is rely on Jesus to help him with the rest. So my question to you guys this morning and all of us, right, is what do you believe? You know, we're all in church on a Sunday, right? We probably believe in God or higher power, right? But what do you really believe? Where in your mind could you use some change, right? A refreshing, a renewing. Do you really believe that God cares enough about you to spend his time, his precious time, pursuing you and changing you and working on you and loving you, right? This man had to be completely honest and vulnerable about where he was at, right, before Jesus could help him, right? Only then was Jesus able to change his mind. Because true life doesn't start with just a resolution, right? It starts with the true change that comes through Jesus. You know, and I wanted to explain to you guys or share with you guys this morning, um, you know, some stuff in my life where Jesus had to change my mind and refresh my mind and my way of thinking. You know, so early on as a Christian, um, I struggled with this thing called legalism, right? And then many of you guys know this already, but I'm still going to define it. You know, I, I find that kind of cool to define things. Um, so it's a noun, right? And it means excessive adherence to law or formula. So it's like you have a set of rules and regulations, and you start to focus on the laws and the rules and the regulations, and you start to forget about the why, the reason why, the heart, the heart behind it, right? Oftentimes, it's because of fear or desire to control, Right? You know, and for me, you know, I wanted to please God. I was new in my faith, and I, I, desi I desired so much to please God. And I was so afraid of disappointing him. You know, I wanted to control my life and my environment around me so that I wouldn't disappoint God. You know, and that gave birth to this legalism, right? Uh, this adherence to, to the law and the formula and the regulations, right? But my life looked like I was a Pharisee, you know? And it felt my faith felt like a jail, right? I desperately needed a mind change I didn't even know it. And I wouldn't even admit it. People in my life would try to tell me, dude, I think you're a little legalistic, man. I'm like, no, nah, man, don't call me that. Don't call me that word, you know? Don't, don't, don't use my name. My wife is laughing because she knows it's true, right? <laughs> don't use my name <laughs> in the same sentence with that word. Kurt knows it too because he tried to help me. <laughs> he, tried to help me. <laughs> he tried to help me many times. And I was like, ah, oh, don't, don't use that word, bro. Use a different word. I don't like that word, right? I was so defensive, you know? And, uh, but, but God helped me to accept that hard truth, you know, and he, he brought me to a point where I was able to admit it. I was able to be honest with myself and admit that, oh, man, I think I am legalistic. I think I do have this struggle, you know. And after admitting it and kind of coming to the realization, you know, they say the first step is admitting you have a problem, right? That's the first step into recovery, right? You know, and I had to admit that, and then only then did I start looking at the scriptures. I started studying out the Pharisees and Jesus' response to the Pharisees, you know. I started looking at, you know, scriptures about God's heart, you know. Um, you know, he doesn't desire sacrifice, you know. Um, you know, I started looking at, you know, examining the word and allowing God to change my mind through the word, right, and through people in my life. I was able to live a new life and get out of that spiritual jail, to the point where, you know, the last ministry that I just moved from, you know, I was, my, my wife and I were kind of sharing uh, with some of our friends down there, you know, kind of who I used to be and how I used to be when I first became a Christian. And, and they were like, really? Like, that's interesting. Like, I, I can never see you being that way. And I was like, you can't? Like, wow. You know, but I didn't get there. I didn't get there by just like gathering up all my strength. That's how I'm going to change. I'm going to do this. You know, or making a resolution. No offense, those like resolutions. You know, I didn't get there by doing that. Right. When I look back and I heard people say that and I look back at, at my life and how far God had brought me, I saw something supernatural, a change, a change of mind that only would happen through Jesus, only could happen through Jesus changing the structure of my thinking. 
right? Only through an encounter with Jesus, through the scriptures and through people in my life, was God able to change me in that way and give me a new mind, right? And that new mind led to a new life. And yeah, I still struggle with that, right? But my life is completely different. I don't feel like I'm in a jail, right? So, you know, looking at back at the, at the Father in this scripture, you know, we all have some unbelief. You know, I'm not sure if you're willing to accept that, but we all have some unbelief, right? All of us. You know, there's some area in our life where there's some unfaithfulness, you know, some, some disobedience, right? An area where we need Jesus to help us overcome our belief, our unbelief. You know, and there's many characters in this story. You know, as we kind of move on to the next point, you know, look at, look at all the characters in this story and just think to yourself, who, who walked away changed? You know, who actually walked away transformed with a new mind and a new life? You know, and it was only the ones who had an encounter with Jesus and allowed him to change their minds and their ways of thinking, right? The teachers of the law, you look at them, or the, you, know, some, some, uh, you know, some of the versions of the Bible will, will call them the scribes, some will say teachers, teachers of the law, um, but did they walk away changed? I say no, because if you keep on reading, uh, we're in chapter 9, if you keep on reading to uh, chapter uh, 14, verse 43, exactly, you know, the teachers of the law, and along with the chief priests and the elders, they sent Judas, right, with a crowd, with clubs and swords, to arrest Jesus and have him killed. And they succeeded, right? And that seems like an unchanged mind to me, right? They were the same. They didn't change, right? They didn't allow Jesus to change them, you know? But how open are you to allowing Jesus to change the very structure of your thinking and the way that you think? Because I promise you it's worth it. I promise you it's worth it to be closer to a God who created you, who loves you, who's passionate about you, more than any human being has any passion for you, right? Because only when Jesus renews us are we able to live a life that we can never have lived before. So, you know, as we kind of look at this, uh, this uh, second, second half of this lesson here, I want to I wanna look at, uh, focus more on the son, right? We looked at the father and we kind of saw, you know, how Jesus changed his mind. But I want to look at the son. Um, and I want to look at this idea of uh, Jesus remove, re renewing our lives by removing what is harmful. Removing what is harmful or holding us back. You know, and it's the idea that we can't live a new life until the things that are harming us or holding us back are renewed, right? So I want to start again in verse uh, 25 in Mark chapter 9. I'm going to read to the end of this section. All right, so in verse 25, it says, When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. You know, some manuscripts will say prayer and fasting, all right? So let's take a look at the son, right? We see, uh, we, 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 we saw before as he read about the father that, you know, what, what the son was going through, what he was experiencing in his life. You know, this evil spirit, what he was doing to him, you know, throwing him down, you know, foaming at the mouth, you know, robbing him of his speech, right? Trying to throw him in the fire to kill him. You know, we saw what was going on there. And then verse 17 and 18 kind of ends by him saying that, you know, describing the son, saying he became rigid. And I was curious about this word, so I took time to look it up. Right, and it's this Greek word called a uh, name say rhino, right? Say rhino, which means to to dry up, or to make dry, um, or to be withered, or to waste away. You know, and like this was his life, right? This was his this was his his life. What he experienced, you know, he was withering away. He was drying up, right? Wasting away. This evil spirit was trying to take his life right from him, right? And you keep on going in verse 20, we see that when the evil spirit, you know, saw Jesus, it did more damage to him. And you think that in the presence of the Son of God that you, you would get your act together and stop doing what you're doing, right? But it did more. It did more damage. It's like, oh, I got one more chance. Take one last hit at him before Jesus drives me out, right? Pretty messed up spirit, you know? And then we look at him, right? Let's look at him kind of as he encounters Jesus, right? And in verse 25, Jesus rebukes the impure spirit. He says, you deaf and mute spirit. You know, he calls the spirit by name or by the exact qualities of what it was doing to the boy, right? And that's important. That's important to call it by name. Call it out exactly what it is that needs to be removed, right? 
even in our lives, we can apply that and know exactly what it is by name, specifically, what is it that we got to remove, right? That's harming us, right? Doing us harm. You know, and then in verse 26 and 27, he lifts the boy to his feet and he stood up. And that's really significant because if you look back at verse uh, 16, you know, we see that the spirit was often throwing him to the ground, right? Throwing him to the ground. That was his life. Rolling around, foaming at the mouth, being thrown to the ground. But after he encounters Jesus, he's able to stand. He's able to stand, right? Without a spirit. Like without an evil spirit. He had a spirit, right? But without an evil spirit inside of him. He's standing on his feet. No evil spirit. Completely renewed. Completely renewed after Jesus removed the evil spirit, right? But he can never have lived this new life that he's now living. Standing up, evil spirit free, right? He would never have been able to live that new life if he didn't allow Jesus to remove what was harming him, right? And I've had some things in my life that God's had to remove, right? Some things were, were easy. Some things were hard. You know, one of the things that was actually hard for me, believe it or not, was early on in my life, I really loved sneakers. Like, I loved sneakers. I had, like, I was what they called a sneaker head, right? You know, now I have a family with a kid. I can't afford that anymore. I can't afford that lifestyle, right? Um, nor do I want to, right? Um, but for me, like, it's one thing to like something. Like, sneaking your know, shoes are good. You know, they're, they're a good thing. It keeps you from stepping on things that harm your feet. You know, you walk around, you look nice. It's a good thing, right? But I took it, like, too far. Like, I took it, like, you know, like, it became an obsession. Like, it became, like, an unhealthy obsession. It became an idol for me. It became something I was pursuing instead of God. Like, like I remember, um, so, so for me, I would wear my shoes, and I would only put them back, like, in the original box with the original wrapping that it came in. Every time, every time I wore them, right? I had like over 50 pairs of sneakers. Like my closet was getting like, like my shirts couldn't hang anymore because like the boxes came up too high, you know, in the closet. I was like, oh, this is getting kind of a lot, but I like it, I like all these shoes, you know? Um, and then I would clean them every single time until they were new before I put them back in the box, you know? Um, I would have these apps on my phone, like you, you know, like Facebook and Instagram and all these social media apps. I would have apps on my phone that were basically that, but for sneakers. So you go on the app, and it's only like people posting pictures of like rare sneakers, like unique colorways, and like, you know, sneakers that are hard to get that are worth like a couple hundred or thousands of dollars, right? Um, and I would just be on these apps all day. I'm in class, I was in college at the time. Professors talking on my phone, like looking at these sneakers, you know, not even paying attention, right? It was like an obsession for me. And I remember when I was studying the Bible uh, with a brother that had reached out to me, um, you know, we're sitting down and we're looking at uh, Matthew 6, talking about seeking first the kingdom of God. And he's like, hey, man, let's, let's make like a priority list, you know, like in terms of like what are your priorities in life? I was like, okay, cool, let's do it. You know, and we, we listed it out. It was like, you know, ex-girlfriend at the time and like, you know, money and success and future. And number four was sneakers, right? And he was like, uh, okay, so where on this list is God? And I was like, well, God is somewhere on the list, you know, like, I don't know, somewhere down there. Um, and then... As it was like written down on paper, like in front of me, I looked at it and I saw, I was like, wait, how am I gonna, if I were to die like right now, how would I explain this one to God? Like, he'd be like, sneakers? Like, really? <laughs> like, I can understand the other things, maybe, but like sneakers, you know? Um, and I just remember thinking like, I gotta change this, man. Like, I gotta, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta change this. I gotta get rid of these apps. These apps are a distraction. Get rid of that. I started giving away sneakers, selling them, right? Um, and I kept like a few, right? But it was 50. It was 50, it was 50 pairs. I can keep a few, right? There's 50 pairs of sneakers, right? Over 50 actually, right? Um, you know, and, and so, you know, I have a, it's funny because now I have a pair in my closet, I have a few in my closet. I don't even wear them anymore because they're so bulky and I don't like shoes like that anymore. So it's just like I, I had to realize like what the issue was and God had to remove it from my life. I had to be willing to take away what was doing harm to me spiritually, you know. Um, and it just happened for me that one of those things was sneakers, right? And there was many other things, right? But because of those things and because of God removing those things, I'm here today, right? And I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple of Jesus because of that. Not because I tried really hard to be a disciple. Oh, trust me. There were days I was like, I don't know if this is going to happen. Like, I, there's no way. These brothers are telling me the way that God has changed their lives and the kind of lifestyle that they're living. And I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. Like, I can't do what you do. You know, and I was right. I couldn't. Right. But I could do it with Jesus. Right. And only after Jesus removed these things that were harming me in my life. You know, so as we kind of bring this in for, for a close, you know, 
I want us to look at ourselves, right? To just do some introspection, you know, and kind of examining ourselves, right? Because no matter how young or old or, you know, say we're, whether we're a Christian or not, it, it's, it's always good and, and to do some self-examination, right? And to, to think about ourselves and think about, okay, where, where in my heart could there be something that's, or in my mind or in my life, that's something that's harming me or doing harm to me, you know, spiritually, you know? What are the things that could be harming my relationship with God? What are the things that could be even harming the people around me's relationship with God, with, with God right? You know, just like Jesus, you know, he, he called out these, uh, the, the, the spirit specifically, you know, oh, you deaf and you mute spirit, right? Exactly what was going on. Called it out and then removed it, you know? And then there was times of refreshing, right? Like Acts 3.19 talks about, you know, times of refreshing can come from the Lord once we turn to God and, and repent and have that mind change, right? Times of refreshing came to this boy after Jesus removed what was harming him, you know? But what may, may it be for you? You know, it, it could be anything. I'll take some shots in the dark. It could be friendships. It could be a relationship. It could be a, a, a friendship or relationship that's, that's harming you. Maybe it's distracting you from God. Maybe it's keeping you away from him. You know, it could be unforgiveness that God wants to remove, right? Bitterness, resentment, something that hasn't been healed or, 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 or you know, healed or moved on from or forgiven, right? It could even be some type of trauma, right? Trauma is something that's not our fault, but it happened, right? And God wants us to have healing and resolution. He wants to remove that from our life, right? It could be a dependence on, a, on, a, on sensuality or dependence on a substance, you know, to make life feel like it's worth living. You know, I've been there before, right? God could even want to remove a lack of something, right? Like he could want to remove a lack of love, right, from our heart. Looking at a dying world or a hurting world, that's suffering, you know, suffering spiritually, suffering physically, emotionally, right, mentally, and just looking at it and not really doing anything, you know. Uh, God can want to remove that lack of love from my heart, you know. Lukewarmness, right? I've been lukewarm as a disciple, right? And God had to remove that from me, had to show me, right, that I lost my first love, right, that I let something else take that place, right, to, to remove that so then I can put him back, where he needs to be, which is first place, you know, as my first love in my life. And the list can go on and on. I'm throwing some shots in the dark to get you thinking, but you know, what, what could it be for you, right? What, what could God be trying to speak to you today, right, to help you? And will you take some time to do some self-reflection, you know, um, to think about that? So as we bring it in for a close, I want us to take one last quick look at the boy, because there's something significant that I want us to just, to just to think about, right? So this boy, right, he was plagued with the evil spirit. Jesus removes the evil spirit, and then he's left on the ground, right? And everyone around him is saying what? You know, they're, they're saying, oh, it looks like he's dead. It looks like a corpse, right? I think the guy is dead, man, you know? And then what does Jesus do? He takes him by the hand and lifts him up, right? So he went from having a, a, a lifeless or dead appearance to then being on his feet and having an appearance full of life, right? No longer, no longer looking like he's dead or dying or looking like a corpse, right? And if you think about that, that's significant because isn't that exactly what Jesus does through us in the cross? It's the same thing, right? You read through Romans 6 and, you know, it talks about us dying to our old, being crucified with Christ, dying to our old self, right? So that the, the old self is done away with and no longer lives, right? But now we're, then we're raised to life and we live a new life in Christ. It's so significant. It's so symbolic, you know, in this scripture. So I encourage you, you know, some of us might make a resolution, some of us might not, but I encourage you, if you really want true change, to look to Jesus, right? Look to the one who went through suffering and torture, giving up his, his image, giving up his popularity, giving up his body, right? Giving up his blood, right? Sacrificing his comfort in heaven to come down, right? To us, to, to stoop to our level, right? Look to him, the one who gave up everything, right? So that you could have everything. Look to him, right? as you're looking for true change in your life, right? And I want us just to remember that as we go through this new, year, new season, it's a brand new year, 2019, it's exciting. You know, some of us maybe had a good year. You know, oh, I'm sad to see it go. Some of us maybe had a, a tough year and we're excited for the new year to come and start fresh and new. But, you know, I just encourage you to think about the, the couple of points that we looked at in the lesson today and allowing Jesus to renew you by changing your thinking right, and the way that your mind is structured, and also by removing the things that are doing harm to you spiritually in your life, because only when Jesus renews us 
can we live a new life? Amen. Amen.